What does it cost to get something from one of your favorite online retailers delivered to your door? I'm going to talk to you in this video about what it costs to run a fulfillment or distribution center and how that cost flows through into the products that you buy online. If we haven't met before, my name's Frank Cho. I'm here to help you live a richer life by helping make financial information clear and transparent for you to be able to make wise choices in your life. I've worked in corporate finance for about a decade and I've worked for a couple big companies in this space, Amazon and Chewy. They operate in a very similar way and most warehouses and fulfillment centers operate in the same manner. Any other retailer is going to incur similar costs from a structure basis. If this is something that you find interesting, make sure to Hit that subscribe button below and destroy that like button for the YouTube algorithm. That being said, let's jump right into it. All right, so I hope that I can share some interesting and informative details here for you about how exactly a fulfillment center works from a cost standpoint. So I'm talking from the standpoint of finance and I can do this because of my work background. I can't give you all of the ins and outs and exact dollars and cents, but I can tell you directionally, you know, how things work, how things are proportioned. And what I'm going to share with you today, I've actually given as a presentation in a major finance conference before. So I've been invited to speak on this topic. So I, I feel like it's something I can speak on with a little bit of authority here. You're going to find that Walmart and these other big companies operate a lot of fulfillment centers distributed across the United States, and they operate in the same manner. And so here, when we're looking at these costs to fulfill a order so what this means is when you place an order online and you click that buy now button this is what's happening on the back end so inside that warehouse to get that order ready and in a box and out to you that's fulfilling the order and so this fulfillment cost is broken up into different pieces so let's talk about what that is when you're looking at running a warehouse you can see here in this pie chart that about half of the cost of fulfilling the order is just in transportation. So transportation meaning the freight it costs to bring that package or that item into the warehouse and the outbound freight to bring it to your door. Then you've got general and administrative expenses that are about 15%. And then the other third is bucketed into fixed costs and variable costs. So we talked about it before, but fixed costs are those things that you have in place that you can't control really in your cost structure and that aren't going to vary with the increase in a unit of production or sales. So for example, rent. Your rent for your building is not going to change whether you sell one unit or a million units. So those are those fixed expenses. And variable, this is going to change with each incremental unit that you sell. And so variable, when you're talking about fulfillment centers, the variable cost is primarily comprised of labor. Let's take a look here. When you're looking at the warehouse, again, that fixed component is those things that you can't really impact too much. So the fixed side depreciation. So if you own the building and you're writing that building off slightly over time, the depreciation of the building and the assets in the building, that's fixed, right? Salaries. So if you have salaried personnel, their salaries are fixed. Maintenance, equipment, services. So if you have security, janitorial services, those things. But the variable, again, it's the wages and benefits related to hourly people, the people that are going to increase or decrease depending on how much product you're selling. Here's just a zoom up close when you're looking at it. About a quarter of the cost is that hourly labor and then about 12% is the fixed cost there. So again, this is roughly a third, you know, a little bit more than a third of the total cost. The variable side is two times as expensive as the fixed side. With the whole part of the pie we're talking about here, this one third or so of the total cost, only this amount can be controlled within your, your sphere of influence in that fulfillment center or that warehouse. So much of the planning that goes into this is around the labor, making sure you have the right people and the right job at the right time to get those orders out to you. Because when you order on Amazon, you have an expectation that you're gonna get your product within the time designated. You know, if it's a two day delivery, 
you expect it to be there. And so it has to be staffed appropriately to handle two-day fulfillment for everything that is ordered that comes out of that site. Of this variable cost, how it gets broken down, two-thirds of that is outbound. So this means the people that pull things off the shelves, put it in a box and get that box onto a truck that will of course make its way to you. The remaining third of the cost is inbound. So people taking stuff off trucks, getting it onto the shelves, and then you have an even split on the other sixth between your administrative personnel that are directly into the operation there in the warehouse and then inventory control, quality assurance. Those people are here making sure things are in the right place. Let's take a look here, what the metrics are that get tracked. What is Amazon so well known for, right? You hear all these stories about Amazon where man, they track all these people and everywhere you go in the warehouse and they're recording how often they scan and all these things and it's true, that's what they do. It's, it's how they measure themselves, right? It's just like any of these, uh, you know, tech firms that are very metric heavy, it's important because understanding your metrics helps drive the business. They're always looking at a couple of things here. You've got variable cost per unit, which is how much cost goes into each individual item, each unit that's sold. So this is that hourly labor component we talked about. Fixed cost per unit, same thing on the fixed side. And then you've got your fulfillment cost per order. So it's just a combination of that fixed and variable cost. And then you multiply that by however many units you have in an order. Usually you're not just ordering one thing. An average order is say three items. And so then you would take your fulfillment cost per order by taking these unit costs and then just multiplying it by three. When it comes to planning for labor, there's a lot that goes into this with so much information being required to go into the planning process. You have to be able to track your data. And so ultimately it gets down to really two factors that are going to determine what these costs are. So how many hours you have to have and then what that costs you. So when you think about an hour of labor, this is where it's tracking the people's productivity. If one person can average, say, 20 units in an hour, then you have a rate associated with that person. When you know the rate that a person can produce, then you can back into the number of hours. So if they're working on a 10 hour shift, I know this person can do 200 units, so 20 times 10. If one person can do 200, then I need that number of people times whatever, you know, order fulfillment I require in that shift. With that, these components are what help get you to that. So the rates, which we just talked about, attendance, you're not going to get 100% attendance. It's just like elementary school, right? So if you have 80% attendance, you need to increase the number because you don't care about how many people are on the roster as much as you care how many people are in the building. So you have to factor that in. Attrition, so if you start the week with 100 people and you end the week with 90 people, that's a high attrition rate. So you have to plan to hire people back in. But when you hire people in, then you have hires and dilution here. Dilution meaning a new person isn't gonna hit that rate on day one. So you have to factor in that they're gonna be coming in at a slower rate until they get to that normal rate. So week one, they might be at 10, week two, they might be at 12, then 15, then 20. So you have to be able to plan that in and you'll have a learning curve for people as they enter the company. So they're not gonna be held to that same standard, but they work their way up to it. What your volumes are, so you have some team out there forecasting, you know, what you expect to come through, what your mix is, depending on what kind of building or items that you have. You might have a bunch of small items like say cell phone cases, or you might have big items like containers of kitty litter. And those don't run at the same rate. It takes longer to process bigger items than it does to do something small. Support hours are usually a blanket. So if you have safety personnel there, then they're gonna work just their fixed hours. And whether you have 50 people on your shift or 100, the safety support's usually about the same or maybe has a minor change. Overtime, so if you have overtime, then it's gonna cost more. And then that's gonna change how you run your staffing. 
backlog, meaning how many orders can you have in backlog, but still be able to function. So if you always run a backlog, which you have to always run some backlog, if you run it to zero, then you starve your system and people can't work. So you always have to have some healthy amount of backlog. It's like in manufacturing where you always have work in progress. So it's important to have, but you can't let it swell out of control. What your shift structures look like. So if you're running day shift, night shift, if you run people on the front half of the week, people on the back half of the week, a mix in between, how that's set up. And then finally, for the cost side, you know, what are you paying these people? And by department, what are you paying them? Because one department gets paid different than another department, depending on what they're doing. Factoring all those things together, and if you have shift premiums, and on and on. So there's a lot that goes into this calculation, which is good because that gives finance people like me a job. Uh, very important. So it takes a lot of people to make this happen. You have people on the operation side, so you have managers who are running each of these departments, and they have input based on what their metrics are. You have a finance person who's gonna put it all together and compile the costs. And you have HR who's gonna have inputs on what the hiring plan is and ramp ups in learning and things like that. And then recruiting, when you determine that you have a gap in your head count and you have to bring more people in, you'll have recruiters who go out and run events, job fairs, things like that to bring people in the door so that you always keep your staffing at an optimal level. You don't want to run everybody on overtime uh, all of the time because that really burns people out. And usually these types of jobs have a higher amount of turnover just because it's very physically demanding. One thing I really loved at Amazon is they made you, regardless of what position you came in at, you would go work in the warehouse for a week and learn what it's like and, and understand. Because of that uh, physical demand and the toll it can kind of take on you, uh, there is that high rate of turnover. So it requires a very smooth touch to make sure that you have your staffing right and that you're able to function. So the fact that you can get a package in two days really is amazing, or less even. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it, and I think it's, it's easy to take it for granted that all of this is happening in the background, but it's really an amazing process. And if you get a chance to you know, get online and watch one of the videos of an Amazon Fulfillment Center, it's, it's really quite amazing. All right, let me give you an example here. And I, I have this called a simple example, but it's really anything but simple. But I want to take everything we just talked about and put it into one big example so that you can see what I'm talking about and understand and then get a little color here. Say we pick a department and say this is just the outbound department of a warehouse. You would have some kind of staffing pattern where you probably have uh, people working Sunday to Wednesday and then Wednesday through Saturday and then Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. And the reason is, as you can see here, you want to keep a sort of even staffing throughout the week. Uh, and then you have a little drop off on weekends. Sometimes you'll have part-time people just on the weekends. Ultimately, what you're trying to do is you're trying to solve the equation so that you get exactly the number of hours into the building so that you can fulfill the order volume that you expect to receive. Now, forecasting isn't always right or accurate, so that volume isn't necessarily gonna be exact, but you wanna be really close because there's only a few levers you can pull usually related towards overtime, calling either voluntary or mandatory overtime. So when you're staffing here, you can see, okay, well, we wanna have even staffing, so you have it set up like this, but all of those factors that we just talked about come into play. For example, if you have this number of people here you start the week at 99 and you end the week at 95. So it's assuming you just have a small rate of attrition of say 5%. At these companies, you can see attrition rates of seven or 8%, just again, because of the demand of the work. With a rate that high, if you multiply that out, if you think about a quarter in the year, three months, it's about 13 weeks. So you multiply that and you are rehiring your entire buildings worth of people in one quarter and you're doing that every year so four times a year you're staffing your entire building so it can be a big challenge that's why recruiting is such a big part of it so you're always bringing in new people because of the high demand 
and the high level of attrition. Likewise, your attendance, just because these are the number of people you're having doesn't necessarily mean that your attendance is going to be spot on. So if you flow down here, you can see what happens. So if we've got the 5% attrition, we see the heads come out of the building. But then when you factor in, say, just 85% attendance, you have 99 people working 10 hours in a day to see, right, 99 times 10, 990 hours. But with only 85% attendance, you see that number drops down significantly. So because you have that decrease in hours available, that decreases the number of units you can produce. So if we're going to say here a rate of 26 is the number of units that they're going to have per hour, per person, getting out the door, we're getting this many units per shift. And that totals out here by day. So over the course of this week, with all of these factored in, that's 514,000 units. But if we were trying to get to 600,000 units, say, you just back out the math, that means we're this many units off, 514 out of 685, almost 86, then back that into hours, and then back that into the head count. When you factor, again, you have to factor back in the attrition and the attendance. So we are 100 people short. So now, if you were in this position, you would say, okay, well now we need 100 people. Where do we hire them in? And how do we want to spread it across? So we might say, oh, well, let's bring in some part-time people over the weekend or here, we can see in the middle of the week, maybe we're a little short. Maybe we want to staff up more at the end of the week because we see people coming out here and we want to make sure that on days like here, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you can see it kind of drops off. And so because of that, we want to get it back up because people have more time to be online over the weekend and we don't want to have a drop off in being able to fulfill because in that backlog gets high over the weekend and then we have to chew through it over the course of the week. So there's a lot that goes into this. So I hope that you find this interesting. I really do. Uh, it's really cool information. And ultimately when you see it, you can say, oh, well, geez, well, if this cost is say a dollar for variable cost per every item, well, holy cow, right? Every time you buy something from the store, whichever one you choose, say Amazon, it's a dollar of cost just to do the fulfilling in the warehouse. So that doesn't include that freight. That doesn't include that uh, fixed cost, which we saw 2x, right? So tack another 50 cents for that on. And then you add in that other cost and it, it gets quite high. So this is why when you uh, shop at these stores, they try and push you into a, a membership program so they can kind of offset some of this and get you into their ecosystem. So Amazon wants you to be Prime, Walmart wants you to be Walmart Plus now, Chewy wants you to be on the recurring uh, subscription basis so that they have more predictive uh, order volumes. And so all of these things are in place to try and help mitigate that. It's a very expensive proposition, and we're not even talking about you know packaging or anything like that either here. Uh, so do keep that in mind as you're ordering online. Just you know what goes into it. it it's a lot of fun. It's very interesting. I, I find it fascinating. If this is something you want to learn more about, hit the comments below and let me know because I can talk about things like this in great detail and I enjoy talking about the, the uh, corporate side because I've, I've gotten to work in this environment and I've also spent a good deal of time working in manufacturing. I worked for a supplier for Tesla, I've worked for General Motors, I've been in these big companies and there's some really interesting things you can learn just about business in general. And again, I'm not telling you anything here that is really super top secret information. I'm not giving you exact numbers or anything, but this is just the general idea behind it. Again, I hope you found this interesting. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. If you want to learn more about personal and corporate finance, uh, I'm here posting content all week. I appreciate you being a part of the team. Hit that like button for the YouTube algorithm and I'll see you next time.